Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here in such large numbers, even though John is right now giving the kernel reports, which I would have liked to go to myself. Um, today, I'm going to talk about a, uh, some things that uh, I've experienced and that I think uh, are an opportunity to improve how we build embedded systems. Um, let me first say a bit about myself. Um, my name is Arnaud van de Capella. I'm an uh, embedded software architect, whatever that means, uh, with a focus on uh, integration of Linux-based systems, so embedded systems. Um, I've been a consultant at Mind since 2008, and so there my work is doing exactly that. Uh, I've worked for plenty of uh, different companies in, in different projects in uh, many different domains. And I'm a uh, maintainer of one of the four maintainers of BuildRoot. Um, I have to say, though, that what I'm discussing now is also a surprise for my BuildRoot colleagues. So it's not the opinion of BuildRoot, it's my own opinion. Uh, I have checked it with my colleagues, though, at Mainz, so it is more or less Mainz opinion. Um, so what uh, I want to discuss is some things that are missing when we uh, use the existing build systems uh, to build an embedded system. Um, when I see at my customers uh, how people build an embedded system, there are a number of issues that always pop up, that always have to be done, and for which tools exist, for which um, solutions exist, but there's still some reinvention that needs to be done. Uh, and th there are four things that I want to highlight here. There are probably more things as well that I'm missing, but these are the four that I could think of. Um, first is field updates, um, so uh, updating the software uh, after deployment. Um, and second is uh, persistence, and related to that is factory resets. Um, the third one is uh, how to do manufacturing, and uh, related to that also uh, provisioning. Um, so how to get the software uh, on the device before it goes into the field. And the final one is uh, verified boots. Uh, now, on all these topics, uh, I'm, uh, I have some familiarity with, uh, with it, but I'm not an expert, and uh, as I sit, there is still some work to be done. Um, so I absolutely welcome uh, feedback during the presentation or afterwards. Um, so please interrupt me if you have any remarks or questions or whatever, and I'll try to uh, get this in a more or less organized way to the end. Let's start, however, with discussing a bit about uh, build systems. So I expect that most of you are familiar with uh, some kind of build system uh, to, to produce an embedded system. There are two which are uh, very well known, and uh, I almost everybody uses them. That's uh, Open Embedded or Yocto. Um, I'm going to use Yocto in the remainder of this talk and not try to do this distinction between Open Embedded and Poking and Yocto, uh, and build Um They're in fact, very similar. Um, I use both of them. Uh, and uh, so what, what, what is good about them is that they are very configurable, that uh, they have everything that you need to build your embedded system. So they, they provide all the, the tools, all the packages that you're going to need. Um, but there is still, um, in, in my opinion, some redundant work that you have to do to get to an actual uh, product. Then I'm going to, to, to introduce two others which go further, uh, and that is OpenWRT and uh, Foundries IO. There are many others, um, but these are just some some uh, highlights to uh, disting I mean to explain why uh, there these problems are solved, but not in BuildRoot and OpenWRT. Uh, so in uh, OpenWRT. Um, what they do is basically make some, uh, well, make a lot of explicit choices about the the kind of system uh, you build. So there there is less freedom for uh, you as a developer to make these choices. The choice has already been been made for you. Uh, and OpenWRT has kind of niche choices. It uses Yugos, it uses Procd, uh, so it, it's uh, yeah, pretty specific. It's also pretty focused on the uh, routers as the embedded system. Uh, it can theoretically be used in other contexts as well, but you know it's uh, like fitting a uh, what is it a round hole in a square peg or something. Um, and there's also some things missing, like Rust. Uh, there's no Rust support. Uh, I think there's also no Meson support. 
or well, there, there's some still uh, things missing there. Um, and so it's pretty niche. Uh, and then there's Foundry's I.O. Uh, well, Foundry's I.O. is bigger, bigger than the build system, but it has the uh, Linux micro platform build system, which is basically a derivative of, of uh, Yocto. Uh, also making some specific choices, uh, like uh, using OS3 for the update system, uh, using a, a writable root file system, and I'll come back later to what that implies. Um, and so wha what I'm basically trying to claim in this uh, presentation is that we should make these kind of choices or at least offer these options uh, in an integrated way in other build systems as well. Uh, now the thing with Foundry's I.O. and others like that, so um, I think Balena uh, is similar, uh, it's very, it's tied pretty tightly to their uh, Foundry's I.O. cloud-based uh, system. Uh, and so uh, also it's pretty much focused on using Docker for application development. So it's uh, again a fairly niche, uh, well, it's, it's applicable very generally, uh, but it has uh, very specific choices with which are not appropriate for all systems. Um, so the traditional dis distros are uh, another thing, sometimes used in embedded systems, but not often. Uh, so with traditional distros, I mean Fedora, Debian, Ubuntu, uh, and the like. Um, they're obviously more focused on the desktop and the server use cases and not on embedded use cases. Uh, and the, the way they are typically uh, configured is to boot an installer and then update via uh, a package manager and uh, everything is writable. None of these are really up, I mean, useful in embedded systems or we actually want to actively avoid these things in embedded systems. Um, and then it turns out that they're uh, not even ideal for the desktop use case. So Leonard uh, Puttering made this uh, blog post a few months ag ago uh, about basically the same things that I'm discussing now. Um, it's a kind of coincidence that he came up with this idea at the same time as me. Um, but I've used a lot of his, uh, his thoughts to make this presentation. Uh, so I absolutely um, uh, um, advise to, to check out this post. It's not directly applicable to embedded systems, systems, but the ideas are there. Um, so now going to the, the uh, missing things in uh, embedded build systems. Um, the first one is uh, field updates. When you deploy a system, every system needs to have uh, a way of doing field updates. There is simply no way that you can deploy so something and then hope that it's going to work like that forever. Um, at, at least for Linux-based systems, um, and definitely if it's network connected. Um, usually this is called over-the-air updates, but yeah, sometimes there are different mechanisms like with uh, 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 um, USB media that you plug in or something. Uh, so that's why you use field updates here. Um, and almost always the, the approach that is chosen is using an AB update, so having uh, two copies of the root file system, the kernel, device tree, and other supporting materials, uh, and, and swap between them. And then if you, you, you boot the new system, if that doesn't work, you fall back to the old one. Um, and tools exist for this. Uh, so software update, RAUC, Mender, and there are more. Um, so there is, you could say, okay, this is a solved problem. Um, because the, the build systems uh, integrate all these two tools. So all these three, they exist in, in uh, both uh, open embedded and in build root. So you can ask, okay, wha what, what is, why? why is this still a problem? Well, in terms of integrating this, there are still some, uh, some gaps. Uh, the first one is that uh, we uh, almost always, when you build a system, you have to distinguish between the, uh, the image that is used for manufacturing, which is the complete image, which has the the uh, boat or which has the space for both partitions which has a bootloader that is going to uh, to be able to to swap between them so is is able to um, choose whether to boot a or b um, 
And then you have the update image, which contains just the, uh, which doesn't contain a bootloader, which just contains one of the two systems, uh, uh, which possibly, um, well, which contains the, the uh, only device tree uh, kernel in a root file system, and which puts this in some kind of image format, which uh, corresponds to the uh, to the update system that you use. For inc for instance, for um, uh, SW update, it's a CPIO archive. Um, so the w w basically what you need to do in your build system is to create both these images. Uh, of course, this is uh, this is not rocket science. It's easy to do that. It's just something you still have to do uh, when you use the, the build system. Uh, if it was just this, I wouldn't make a presentation about it. But there's more. Uh, there's also some things missing outside of uh, the build systems. Um, uh, for example, in U-Boot, uh, U-Boot does not actually directly support this use case. Basically, what, what all these um, update systems do is they, they provide U-Boot scripts uh, to do the swapping or, or to, to choose the, uh, the A or the B, um, which basically means you have to either patch the default environment in your U-Boot uh, configuration um, or uh, you have to have a custom environment. Um, and they also use the U-Boot environment to choose between A and B. That part is fine. Now, the problem with that is, to with having the scripts, is that it's uh, um, somewhat fragile. Um, and then when we come to verified boot, for instance, uh, it means you're it's, it's hard to protect your U-Boot environment uh, for a verified boot um, because the script is in there. So if you, if you do the swapping between the two, um, it's it's not signable, uh, and but the script which does the boot is in there, so yeah, you, you have a kind of difficult situation there. Um, plus, the U-boot environment can be corrupted. In that case, you fall back to the, the uh, default environment. So basically, you have to make sure that this uh, AB logic is in the default environment. So uh, again, there are solutions. Uh, without patching U-Boot, but it would be easier if this logic was directly in, in U-Boot. And then there's another issue, uh, which I mm, which is semi-solved also, but yeah, it needs thought by the developer again. That is that U-Boot uh, and TFA itself um, uh, often also need to be updatable. So in many cases, I've seen that after a few years, there is some use case for actually updating U-Boot or updating uh, TFA in the fields, which is annoying if you didn't foresee that uh, when building the initial system. Um, on UEFI, the situation is better, uh, because there we can just uh, skip the bootloader entirely and boot the kernel directly uh, using the EFI stuff uh, integration of the kernel. Uh, and RAUC, for instance, I haven't checked with SWU update, but uh, RAUC can directly set the, um, uh, the EFI boot order uh, and boot next to basically implement the AB. And so you have nothing there that, that uh, interferes. Um, and there's also systemd boot, which I'm not sure if it's suitable for embedded systems, but um, it's an option uh, that can also be, uh, uh, choose. It, it only works on uh, UEFI systems uh, that can also choose between uh, A and B based on a version number. So you just the, the file name uh, determines which one is going to be booted. So now back to the uh, build systems. Uh, so yeah, for software updates, okay, there is some um, some friction there, but it's not too bad. Um, but it becomes worse if we take in uh, persistence. So persistence, because we do this AB updates, um, we can't simply have a writable root file system and put our uh, persistent data in there, because then when you, when you swap to the B partition, yeah, you lose everything which was in the in the old root of it. Um, which means there is a you need you need a separate volume for the persistent data, uh, a separate partition. Uh, so that must be that must be created. That must be mounted somewhere, um, and it also must be populated. So the, uh, usually there are some uh, initial directories that you need on there. Uh, sometimes some initial files. Um, so yeah, there there is stuff to be done there. Again, it's not rocket science. Uh, there are a bunch of solutions for this. 
I, I have three here, and you can probably invent more. Um, so one solution is uh, putting an overlay of this on, on root itself, uh, which is really easy because you can just act as if uh, the thing is writable. But there are some dangers uh, with that. Uh, so it makes uh, root uh, writable, which means that if an attacker can somehow uh, write to, to something, um, that it can actually uh, modify your root file system, can modify any file. Um, it's uh, a bit safer to have a, a limited scope of where modifications can be done. Uh, or it doesn't necessarily be have, have to be an attacker, it can also be accidental, of course. Uh, in practice, you usually uh, need an initram of this to make this work. I mean, you can uh, mount it directly from the kernel command line, but it, it's a bit involved uh, in uh, for instance, with systemd, it's not possible because uh, if you have any systemd configuration file in Slice BTC, uh, it's not going to be read by systemd um, if it's passed on the, uh, well, whatever. So I in practice, it often requires an inner terminus. I'm actually not 100% sure if it really always is the case. Um, you can also directly mount, for instance, uh, slash var, and then make sure that anything that needs to be written is in slash var. Um, now, often you need some files in slash etc to be writable. Um, for instance, a machine ID if you use uh, systemd. Um, if you use network manager, the, the network manager settings are in slash etc. Uh, so there are a bunch of things in slash etc that you probably need also uh, to be writable. Um, so then you need bind mounts for those, or uh, you need to have symlinks, uh, yeah, so there's, again, stuff to be done there. It's not, like, out of the box. Um, and then the, the solution that's proposed by, by uh, Leonard Buttering is to have uh, a writable uh, slash, uh, writable root, uh, but have uh, user read-only. Because if you have uh, the unified user concept, then uh, everything which is executable is under user. You're never going to execute anything anywhere else. So the security thing uh, from earlier is then solved by that way by having a read-only user. Um, and you can write uh, etc, and you can write um, uh, var and anything else if you need things like op for something, for instance, to put uh, like Docker images or whatever, you can do that. Um, <coughs> but that one definitely requires an init ram this to, to make that work. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it has to be populated, except for the uh, overlay, because in the overlay case, you can uh, populate it as part of your uh, the, the root file system image. Um, so you need some something that uh, populates it on first boot or uh, when producing the image. Um, systemd temp files can do this, but there are some limitations. For, for example, it can't remove files. Uh, sometimes uh, when you do an update, there are some configuration files that are, or, or writable files that are no, no longer needed. Uh, it's not possible to remove those uh, with systemd temp files. So it's, it's always a bit tricky. Um, so what can uh, uh, build systems do here? Uh, it actually goes a bit beyond the build system, but, the, but I think the build, uh, the build systems can be a driver of this. Um, is basically standardizing how uh, persistence is done. So we have all these options. Um, maybe we should just like choose an option and, <laughs> and always do that. Uh, similar to like we kind of converge on doing uh, AB updates. Uh, we can do the same for persistence, saying, okay, this is the approach that we're going to take um, and, and really support that approach. Um, and a, a, a build system can help a lot there because the out-of-the-box configuration could just support that. Could just say, okay, you can assume that your, for instance, your uh, root is read-only and var is uh, writable. Still leave some things to be done for the developer, like uh, if var is writable, any symlinks or bind mounts that have to be created in etc. Um, but you know, it can it can help already a bit. It can. Okay, it takes away a bit of freedom from developers, but it makes things easier for developers as well, because they know what to do. Um, plus, there are uh, a lot of integrations considerations. 
regarding which parts are writable and which parts are uh, read-only. Uh, regarding this, the, the bind mounting, so you need an inscript or an, an um, uh, systemd unit to do those uh, bind mounts. Um, and, and yeah, the build system is in a very good place. It's like a distro, basically. It's in a very good place to to take into account those considerations. So if you install this particular package, the the logic to uh, to apply the persistence that it needs uh, can go along with that. Because you know, if you have a database, for instance, yeah, persistence is going probably going to be needed for that database. Otherwise, there's usually not much point. Um, so the, the default installation of the database can make sure that uh, it has a writable location in the persistent partition. And then, of course, it ties in with the update system. Uh, not so much with the update system itself, but rather with this AB logic uh, and the fact that, I mean, the, the, the partitioning, uh, the ha having an A, a B, and a persistent partition available. Um, so basically what I'm advocating here is that uh, a build system, instead of generating I an image which is the, the minimal image to be bootable on, on a certain target, is to uh, immediately generate an image which has an A and a B partition and which has a separate persistent partition. That's basically my, my um, minimum expectation. <laughs> um, and then related to persistence is factory resets. Uh, so factory reset is in fact trivially simple. It's just wiping uh, or reformatting the uh, persistent partition. Um, but then we basically need to be able to repopulate it. Um, and that ties in with, uh, with the populating that was uh, to be done at first time. So it basically suggests that uh, we should do the population on first boot, uh, and not in, in installer or something like that. Uh, because then we can reuse it for factory reset. Another thing to take into account is recovery from a corrupted uh, uh, persistent partition, because this is writable, even if you use uh, something which is uh, supposed to be power fail safe, um, things tend to go wrong at some point, um, so you need to have a recovery mechanism for that. Uh, that is typically something that if, if an individual developer has to take care of it, they're not going to get around to do that. <laughs> uh, so that's, I think, where having this as part of the build system can help a lot because then the build system can just make sure that, uh, so for instance, a file system check is done and um, that uh, if, if the file system check fails and it's not recoverable, it's reformatted and, okay, you lose your data, but at least the system still works. Um, and uh, wha what I especially want here is to be able to improve so that uh, over time we, we see from use that, okay, there are some use cases that are not covered and then we have a central place with it where it can be improved. If everybody develops their own solution, there is no learning there and, uh, you know, somebody solves a problem and nobody else can make use of that. Yeah? Isn't the file system check at least when using your flow project with system D already part of that? Uh, I, I'm not sufficiently familiar with Yocto to be sure, uh, but possibly. Um, but I don't think that it's also going to reformat in case the file system check is not recoverable. No, um, but yeah, I mean, I it's, uh, it's uh, definitely, I mean, th there, I mean, we, we are not in, um, we're already somewhere. We don't have to start from zero. <laughs> and I think in these things, in general, uh, Yocto goes further than Builtroot. Uh, and of course, I'm more familiar with Builtroot, so uh, I'm uh, possibly sometimes a bit pessimistic about what I already exists. Okay. Um, then we come to manufacturing. Uh, I see I'm taking too much time as usual. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'll go a bit quicker. Um, so manufacturing is basically when you uh, have your uh, board and you need to install an image on it. Um, there are, again, many ways that this can be done, but it always has to be done. Uh, and so developers always reinvent how to do the manufacturing. 
Um, and so here again, same message. I think that there is uh, opportunity there to have something common, um, which is probably should be something that is, I mean, it's not that tightly related to the build system. Um, but the nice thing about the build system is that it's a place where people already uh, converge, where people already uh, collaborate, and so it's a good place to uh, to have the collaboration in place already. Um, again, Yocto is a bit has, has something there already, the which format, um, which uh, covers one use case so where you have where you um, flash it to an, an um, EMMC or uh, SD card and it expands to uh, take the whole uh, the entire space. Uh, provisioning that is something where I have not seen any. Uh, solution that, that is common at this point. Uh, so the idea is that when you manufacture a device, an embedded device, uh, you typically need to put some information on there, um, some persistent inf information, which is uh, device specific. So it can't be part of the root file system because it's different for every device. Um, some of these are, uh, well, you can just generate on fir first boot, like an SSH key. Um, that's easy. Um, and doesn't actually need to be part of provisioning. Uh, however, there are some things which need to somehow come from a manufacturing data database or need to have a relationship with the outside world. Um, a serial number, for instance, a MAC address that needs to come from your set of allocated MAC addresses, uh, a password so that you have a unique password in every on every device, but you still know what the password is. Um, so yeah, there are a bunch of things that either have to come from a manufacturing database or have to be stored in a manufacturing database. And so this is something that people have to reinvent all the time. Uh, both things actually, one is the, the fact that you need to store this somewhere, so you need a separate partition for it, um, that you need to somehow link to the rest of the system. Um, and it cannot simply be the persistent partition because this has to persist even over factory resets. Uh, you don't want to do a factory reset and then lose your serial number or lose your password or lose your MAC address. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's there's <laughs> there really need to needs to go some thought into this. Uh, ideally, also there would be some common way to uh, communicate with the manufacturing database, but I don't think we're there yet because yeah, this manufacturing database is uh, there's nothing at all that exists to. Um, to cover that. Uh, so, yeah, what can we do? Uh, make sure that there is some common tooling and integrate this in, a, uh, in the build systems. Um, yeah, so here it could be outside, but uh, yeah, the build systems are a nice place to discuss it. Uh, and then the final point is verified boot, and my slide got screwed up for some reason. Uh, so basically, uh, this is something I don't really have experience with myself. So I've, I've used devices using verified boot, but I never implemented it myself. So uh, here my knowledge is just hearsay. Um, but the, the important thing is that it's complicated. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is a bit of standardization. I mean, there are two standard approaches for doing uh, verified boot. So just uh, verified boot is basically that uh, when a system is booted, there is some hardware that uh, checks that the first stage bootloader is uh, what you expect. Uh, and then the, that bootloader is going to stay uh, check the second stage bootloader, and that one is going to check the kernel, and then the kernel uh, verifies the, the signatures on, on modules that it loads, and there is a, a, a chain uh, that needs to be maintained. Uh, so the first steps are a bit uh, standardized. So the you UFI secure boot chain, uh, it's supported in some bootloaders, it's supported in the kernel. Uh, then ARM trusted firmware on ARM pla platforms, although there, there are still some uh, SOC specific thing that has to be done on the very first stage. Um, but so as soon as you go into ARM trusted firmware, it's the, it's the same approach everywhere. Um, but still there is no, uh, I mean, this, this standardization is not really implemented in, um, in build systems. Um, 
And then there is still also the problem of the root if itself. Uh, this I'm going to skip completely. Let's just say for the root if there are uh, plenty of different, well, not plenty of, but there are a few different options, uh, and there's no one solution that is used by everybody. Um, and the options are also not ideal. For instance, it's hard to get working on uh, UBI, UBI, so hard to get working on NAND flags. Um, so what, what needs to be done there? It's the same thing again. Uh, some common tooling is needed. Uh, and although this is kind of outside of the scope of build systems, uh, it's um, uh, build systems are a good place to, to discuss it. The common tooling here is not so much in doing the boot chain itself, because that is in uh, in the bootloader, in the kernel, in the etc. Uh, it's rather in generating the images for it. For instance, for uh, DM Verity, you need to have an, uh, um, the, the Verity partition, I mean the, the, the file system itself and a separate uh, uh, checksum partition that has to be generated and is that part that needs to be integrated in a build system and also linking them together. So uh, in your in scripts, making sure that the, um, the, the, the verity is taken into account. Uh, um, and why is commonality important here? Uh, it's to have some standard chains that we know are trustable. Uh, so that, I mean, it's like all security stuff. It's better if this is done in the open and there where the tools are uh, uh, open and only the keys are secret. Um, and so although the implementations are in separate tools, the integration is can be part of the build system. So that's why I think it should be discussed there. Uh, plus, of course, there's also an impact on partitioning if you use DM Verity, for instance. All right, that uh, concludes what I wanted to cover in this talk. Um, so the, the, the main takeaway is that uh, currently developers, developers still have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, they well it's not really reinventing the wheel, but they have to put the pieces together themselves. Um, and, and there are some, not really gaps there, but there are some choices that they have to make which uh, has bigger impact than that you would think at, at first sight. And uh, build systems can help making the right choices there by uh, maybe offering a few al alternatives, but having some flows which are the supported flows. Um, ideally, I prefer to have the freedom to uh, do it differently, uh, but make it easy to do it the standard way. Um, and so I think that this stuff should be part, if in the uh, Yocto case, it should be part of open embedded core and not in some external layer, uh, because the, the core is where you know, there is m most uh, exchange and most um, commonality can be exploited. Um, but the build systems are not alone. We uh, also need some support from upstream tools uh, like uh, bootloader for updates um, to, to make it all work together. Thank you. Are there any remarks or further input or questions? I'm, I'm going to repeat for the recording, uh, and I'm go not going to re remember everything, so I'm going to repeat now. <laughs> uh, so the remark is that uh, he was in a, a similar, he, he also had a product where he needed manufacturing SD cards um, that would uh, install stuff, uh, but it's, uh, an SD card is annoying because it gets lost and uh, yeah, it's, it can break when you pu push it in, uh, and it can actually break the board if you push it in a bit too strongly. Please continue. And, and to, uh, not to evaluate it, but the prob probable solution for that is that we uh, use um, a bit deleted an LXP tool, uh, UBLU, um, yeah. which uh, allows us to uh, connect to the CPU over um, USB. Uh, um, USB and we uh, instrumented using uh, the fast boot capabilities to directly program the MMP to the bootloader. And that's much more efficient and the guys are already happy already. 
uh, but it's actually mentioned in the slide. So uh, what he suggests is that an, an alternative approach, instead of using an SD card and an, an installer approach, um, is to uh, uh, use a USB connection. Almost all uh, socks are able to boot over USB, where you have some tool on the host, uh, on, the, on the PC, uh, that loads an image over USB in memory. Uh, that image is then typically a bootloader, but can actually be anything. Um, the, the image is booted, and then you in, in that image you can do anything. Um, and for instance, from U-Boot, if you use U-Boot as an image, an, an, uh, a specialized U-Boot, you can have all the scripting in there to download another image either over USB or over Ethernet and uh, flash it to the EMMC or NAND. Thank you. Were there any further questions? I, I'm not sure how we are for time. If, if there's time, uh, just a, a general remark. Um, there is such a variety in open and in embedded systems uh, that uh, it's very difficult to implement any, any feature without constraining uh, use within the specific logic. Uh, and so if a user system implements uh, any of the me to use a specific scheme I would not like at all. Uh, so I would love to see uh, in the system uh, like building blocks that I can easily uh, enable uh, and possibly well documented so I know the little glue logic that I have to add. Um, one such example that comes to my mind is the Meta SW update with yesterday. We use SW update which doesn't do all, it does most of the the heavy lifting, and then you have to write your own scripts and a little code. So I, uh, I would, I, I love that approach. So I have to do just the little extra part that's yeah. specific to my use. So Lucas' remark is that um, what he wants is to have the freedom to to still uh, design the system that he likes. And so what he wants is that the uh, build system uh, provides the tools, the, the building blocks, um, and even connects them together to some extent. Uh, but that there is still uh, that the, the, the details in the, the little uh, decisions are still taken by uh, the developer. Um, my own take on that is that I think that uh, the developer should be free to do that. Uh, however, uh, I think the build system should have, the de I mean, the, the default of the build system should be something that just works out of the box and doesn't need further configuration. Um, but while still allowing further configuration. It's similar to how you have, for instance, a kernel configuration. Uh, all the, the build systems, they allow you to use the in tree dev config, but then extending the dev config with your own fragments. So I think we should have something similar for, for all these things, that there is something that works out of the box, um, but with the possibility either ju to just override it and, and not, not use the out of the box system, or to add something, to add some plugins or hooks or whatever uh, to, to slightly modify it to your needs. Uh, you were first. Yeah, uh, I have a question or a comment to, to the, the topic that you have to divide your partition into two parts, uh, a read-only part and a partition part, like with similar with the overlay. Uh, we had a similar problem with adding additional debugger tools to an image our development process, so we don't want to deliver these debugger tools to the customer, just use it in the lab. So uh, we have a need to make an overlay image that oh. can be installed in the, in the device um, to offer these additional debugging tools in the same path as they were installed by the web team. Like Walgreen is a little bit picky about in installing different paths. Um, can I can I repeat it already? <laughs> uh, so th this is a very good remark, actually. Um, so I, I gave basically four points where uh, some uh, stuff that developers need to do all the time. Uh, there's actually a fifth point, and that is debugging. All developers need to do debugging. Now, for debugging, you need debugging tools on your target. Um, and the typically, you don't want to ship a product that includes those uh, debugging tools. So you need a way to have those tools in development and not in a uh, uh, final product. Um, and solution that they chose was to uh, to install it in an overlay, but make sure that it's 
it needs to be an overlay because it really needs to be in the same place that it's expected, like Falgrind expects it uh, its libraries to be in a very specific location. Please yeah. continue. But the the uh, table space uh, caused a problem with that uh, because the dependency tree of the recipe to build these tools, they always assume to build one image. Yeah. The dependency tree goes uh, uh, up from Valgrind down to the bootloader, and uh, we found no way with a Yoxo or with Freeboot to say, uh, put these tools into that image and these tools into the other image and rely on the same dependency tree, just build them once. Yeah, yeah. so that's a good remark again. Uh, so by uh, enabling a, uh, a debug tool in, in, uh, in your configuration, you actually have an effect which goes further down the chain. So there are dependencies that it pulls in. Um, for instance, uh, apparently Valgrind uh, changes something in a bootloader as well. Um, so you basically, you don't, I mean, if you have an, a configuration for your production and a configuration for debug, uh, the it's not that the debug just has some additional files, so it's not so easy to make an overlay. So this is an unsolved problem, basically. Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. Uh, I'm afraid we're out of time, so I can't take any more questions, but I will stay either here or in the neighborhood to discuss things further. Um, Thank you very much for your attention and I hope that I gave a similar talk 10 years ago about software updates and voila, a few years later there were a few tools for that, so I hope that in the same <laughs> way this problem is going to be solved as well. Thank you.